Lee, welcome to Chattanooga. Welcome to Erlanger. We're so incredibly thrilled and excited that you're here. Welcome to the second iteration of our Critical Care Boot Camp. There's three of us hanging out with you today. Uh, standing up is Dr. Aaron Cohen. Uh, Dr. Cohen did his residency and fellowship in critical care at Cleveland Clinic um, and is a not only an amazing educator, but really, really uh, fantastic uh, and heavily involved in quality improvement. Dr. Radhika Shaw, who you guys should all know by now, um, is the assistant program director uh, for the IM residency. Uh, she did her residency at Yale and then to, did pulmonary and critical care at University of Maryland. And Radhika is an even better person than she is a physician. And, um, <laughs> and I'm Jeremy Greenberg. Um, I did emergency medicine at Vanderbilt and then critical care medicine at the University of Arizona. Um, both myself and Dr. Cohen have been here going on three years. This is our third year. And Dr. Shaw has, this is one more than us, one more than us. So welcome. So today is going to feel a bit like a knowledge dump. We recognize this isn't the best possible way to learn. But you have to have that knowledge to call upon in the future. This isn't the end of your critical care education. And this education doesn't just serve you when you're in the ICU. This is to help you no matter where you are on the street, in clinic, on the wards, in the ICU, with the management and resuscitation of critical illness. Because no matter what your specialty, no matter what you do in the future, at some point, you are going to find somebody, you are going to be standing in front of somebody who is dying. And you need to know what to do. You need to make split-second decisions with the understanding that these decisions have the potential to save their life or for them to pass. The only way that this knowledge sticks is if you practice it. So today is the knowledge dump, but what I would encourage you to do in the days moving forward is frequent periodic review. All of you will be given access to these slides. But you can't just sit and review them. You've got to put yourself in a realistic situation. Maybe a situation that you remember from medical school. Or maybe a situation that just happened last week. The only way you truly remember anything in medicine is to mess it up at least three or four times. Usually that fifth or sixth time is when it starts to stick. You're supposed to make mistakes. You're supposed to fail, and that's why you have upper-level residents, sometimes fellows and attendings, to catch you. So welcome. Welcome to Erlanger. So this is, the, do, do people still watch Scrubs? Good. Oh, I'm so thankful. If you haven't, please, at the very least, watch the very first episode of Scrubs. Because I remember, it wasn't so long ago that I was sitting there for my orientation, and this is what I felt like. Overwhelmed, panicked, freaking out, but still kind of excited. If you close your eyes for just a moment, if you reflect on why you went into medicine, I bet at some point it was because you envisioned your life looking something like this. That's Dr. William Osler, for those of you who aren't fans. Uh, I highly encourage you to read or listen to his autobiography. Super cool guy. Kind of like the, um, uh, just a brilliant clinician, brilliant bedside uh, physician, researcher, and he was this huge practical joker. So his, his autobiography is super fun. But anyway, the reason I put this picture up there is because this is what I envision my life looking like. Spending time at the bedside, getting to know my patients, touching them, um, and really understanding the way that disease processes ebb and flow. Over the next three years, this is going to feel 
this may be a more realistic and accurate representation of what it can feel like to be a resident physician taking care of a computer. Now, I will be the first to admit that a lot of what you're going to do is going to be done behind this. However, do not let that computer screen and the electronic medical record get in the way of your becoming a compassionate, empathetic, and passionate cl clinician. Medicine, despite this, is still done at the bedside. And when it comes to critical illness, so much of it is uncharted territory it still comes back to the simple to the simple foundation of coming up with a hypothesis trying something and reassessing and testing the patient coming back to the bedside so this is a picture from my fellowship it's overwhelming it's scary there's a lot of machines there's so many beeps so many beeps that when you're in the ICU you're going to hear those beeps when you sleep but in the ICU, you have the ability to help somebody go from this to this. You have the ability to save somebody's life from the brink of death and give them infinite number of meaningful experiences again with their family and loved ones. What a tremendous privilege. The average ICU patient requires 178 actions per day. Holy shit. 178 actions per day. That is a lot. That is a lot of opportunity for mistake. And this historical model or approach to medicine, this laboriously sitting down and getting a history, then doing my exam, then pontificating with my upper level and resident about pre-test probability and should we get this test. Perhaps we shouldn't get that test. Then we come up with a diagnosis based on our post-test probability and finally, finally, after all of that is said and done, we implement a treatment. We wait, we see him again in the morning. And I would add that to that, today we add in scouring the EMR. I promise you, if you look at most physicians, the way they do medicine is they get a call. They say, I've got a patient for you, or I've got a consult, I've got a consult for you because I need help. And the first thing that they do is they log into the computer. Now, I don't know about you, but I had this belief or this picture in my mind of being like Batman, right? A combination of William Osler and Batman, where I am like running to the patient's rescue. So that's what we're going to try and implement. Gone are the days of sitting at the computer when you first get a call. Uh uh uh. We get up, we see the patient first and foremost. We're going to create a continual resuscitation algorithm, no matter how sick they are, from beginning to end. We're going to go through our ABCDEs. We're going to resuscitate them. Then and only then will we do a comprehensive history and a secondary survey or, and physical exam. And then and only then will we take the time to do our rounds on the patient. This is resuscitation first medicine. We're going to take a page, a lot of pages actually, out of ATLS. And if you haven't heard of ATLS, this is the surgeon's playbook for the resuscitation of the crashing trauma patient. I really wanted to call it ACILS, but it's already been patented. This is going to be our approach, our playbook for every single critically ill patient. What's their big picture reason for being in the ICU? There's only a handful of them, shock, respiratory failure, bleeding, severe acid-base disturbance, airway emergency. There's really only a couple past medical history that really matter to us. Necrotizing fibromyalgia, not so much. Horrendous GERD, I certainly don't ever want to hear about during rounds. You're going to look at their vital signs, and not just the typical ones, not just the heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and SAT, and temp. We also want to know the shock index. You know what the shock index is? The shock index is just the heart rate over the blood pressure. Or made really, really simple, the shock index is just saying, uh-oh, the heart rate's higher than the blood pressure, the systolic blood pressure. That's never a good thing. 
Then, after you've, after or while you've looked at those vital signs, you are every patient, every time, A, B, C, D, E. A, B, C, D, E, just like ATLS. The A is an airway assessment. Is their airway intact? Are they talking to you? Or is it compromised because they're gorped? Is there any degree of strider? B is their work of breathing. Are they working hard to breathe? This is the most ominous physical exam finding you will ever see. You'll take a quick listen to their lungs, make certain that their, their lung sounds, and then do I have any wheezing or crackles? Their circulation, arrhythmia, yes or no. Edema, yes or no. Are their extremities warm or cold? Extremity assessment is right here on the forearm. So the first thing I do when I meet somebody after I introduce myself and I look at their vital signs is I put my hand on their forearm. And then if their forearm is warm, I check their capillary refill time. Do all of you know how to check a capillary refill time? Everybody hold up your finger. Show me how to check a capillary refill time. All of you are doing it wrong. All of you are looking at your nail bed. You're looking at the pulp part of your finger. You're going to press and you're going to hold for 10 seconds. And then you're going to let go and count 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000. Every single one of us should have a cap refill of three seconds or less. And this right here is probably the best window, even better than all the labs we're going to teach you today, into the microcirculation. More about that later. We go on to D. No GCS. Forget that, right? Have you guys ever actually tried to calculate a GCS? You swear you get it right, then the attending comes in and says, oh, did they cross the midline? Do you even know GCS, bro? So, our assessment of somebody's neurologic status is AVPU, AVPU. Are they alert? Do they respond to your voice? Do they only respond to pain? Are they unresponsive? Let's take the complexity and certainty out of it. Do they have any focal deficits? I don't care if you can localize the lesion or not. I just want to know, do they have any focal deficits? Or are, do, is there any stigmata of seizure? And finally, E stands for exposure. This is where you're looking at everything else, but quickly. Do they have any signs of peritonitis? Do they have any signs of a volume-losing process, right? Vomiting, diarrhea. Are they hemorrhaging anywhere? Are they showing you blood, right? Do they have any evidence of rash or cellulitis? No matter what, we come back to A, B, C, D, and E. If there is an abnormality, do not pass go. You stop and you resuscitate. And we're going to give you the tools today to teach you how to do that. After your A, B, C, D, E, you are going to extend your physical exam by putting probe to chest. Ultrasound, point of care ultrasound. We're going to have you looking and practicing on this, looking at the patient and practicing with a point of care ultrasound every single patient, I'm sorry, every single day in the ICU. I can't promise every single patient, but every day in the ICU, we are going to be practicing point of care ultrasound and until it is so ingrained in your cellular memory that you remember it in your next lifetime. And then finally, we get stat point of care labs if we need them. We want to know, and we need to know in every crashing patient, what's their hemoglobin or hematocrit? What are their platelets and INR? Some basic lights. We want a blood gas because you can figure out every acid-base disturbance with two numbers. Maybe they need an EKG, and every sick patient does need a screening EKG, plus minus some cardiac enzymes and probably a chest X-ray. And maybe they need to go through the donut of truth and get a little bit more info through a CT. All right. So after you've done your primary survey, which consists of the reason they're sick, a brief past medical history, their vital signs extended to include shock index and the amount of oxygen they're on, A, B, C, D, E, point of care ultrasound, and stat labs, then we can talk about rounding on the patient. Our goal in rounding on the patient is not to labor on for hours and hours and hours every day. I hate it. I, I, it just takes too long, I get bored, I can't focus, and I know you can't either, and my feet get really tired, right? I remember being a resident and we would round from like 8 until 2 p.m. Sometimes we get a little break for lunch. My feet were killing me, and I couldn't pay attention. And I know nobody can pay attention. The crux, the key, is all going to be turning our rounding into a checklist. 
because that's what we're really doing in the ICU. We are running through a checklist and we are going to do it quickly. And the reason we're going to treat it as a checklist is because we we have learned from the aviation industry that the best way of preventing mistakes when you're dealing with excessively com with excessive complexity, i.e. 178 actions per day, is to turn it into a checklist. So this is kind of a synopsis of what your rounding will look like on a daily basis. And notice that your physical exam is truncated to reflect the A, B, C, D, E model. Here's your plan by systems checklist. And what we're really hoping to implement is the upper level holding this and guiding you through this. Now, you don't only have to touch on these things, but you do have to touch on these things, okay? So, there are three rules. And these rules are unbendable, unbreakable whenever you're in the ICU. Rule number one, you must be willing to work hard. I get it. It's residency, especially when you're having to show up super early. For a month straight is exhausting. It's tiring, but you have to work hard, and I promise you that that hard work pays off. Every day you have to be willing to get just a little bit better than you were the day before, to know one more thing than you did the day before. You have to be willing to learn. That's what this entire process is all about. Good, working hard to provide good patient care while learning as much as you can, creating a foundation that you can build upon when you're done to provide exceptional patient-centered care for the rest of your career. If we, if, if we came into residency knowing this stuff already, this would be a pointless, pointless process. So you're allowed to be wrong. And to demonstrate that you're willing to learn, we are going to, on a frequent and regular basis, say, I don't know. I don't know. We're going to say, I don't know to each other. We're going to say, I don't know to our upper levels. We're going to say, I don't know to our attendings. And we're even going to say it to our patients. We're going to say, I don't know, but I will find out. Because when you say, I don't know, what you're, what you're showing is not that you're dumb. Not that you don't work hard, but that you have just identified an opportunity for somebody to teach you something. So I want you to all practice it with me. On three, we're going to say, I don't know. Ready? One, two, three. Oh, that was pathetic. I heard that you guys had gusto, especially the FM residents in the back. Let's try it one more time. One, two, three. Yeah employ it frequently. I still do. I say, I don't know. And I pull up a complex image and ask Dr. Shaw to look at it. I say, I don't know. Cohen, what do I do? And he says this. Go to my, I still, to this day, go to my colleagues all the time, and I've been doing this for four years. Not that it's that long. And finally, and this is super important, I think the art of learning from the bedside nurse is starting to dwindle, and I think that is a travesty. I think some of the best lessons I ever learned were asking the nurse, what do I do? What does that beep mean? Why are you doing that? They will help you if you demonstrate compassion, that you care, and some degree of humility. The biggest mistake that I see new doctors make is a nurse comes to them and say, says, hey, I'm worried about this, and they say, cool, and they walk away. If a nurse is worried, you are worried, and I don't care where that is. Clinic, floor, ICU, if they're worried, you are worried. You get up, you don't look at the computer, and you go see the patient. All right.